No, Corpus had a tortoise fair the other week that I went to. A tortoise race. It was great. Tortoise race. Can you elaborate on that? Ago? Please. Yeah, it's tortoise tortoise like, tortoise. I mean, I only came for the end, but the other's big tortoise race. You know, they got all hyped. They had all these different <laughs> tortoises, all different species. You know, they got the audience to hold them up and introduce wow. them. Yeah, and then they raised them. It was really quick, actually. I thought it would take. <laughs> it was really quick. Really I think the answer to that would it be it was really quick. What made you choose Oxford? I actually went for the project first. Sure. So yeah, I've got a very kind of um, specific interest in my field. Yeah. And I just kind of looked for PhDs everywhere. Mm -hmm. And there was one at Oxford and I found, you know, it's a really, really great um, research network, lots of, you know, opportunities, great facilities. And yeah, I actually spoke to my supervisor beforehand, you know, mm -hmm. met the lab, which is really useful. Do you think that's the difference <laughs> maybe like between the disciplines that you were applying to a particular project or a particular yeah. lab rather than your sort of own idea that you're finding people that might. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you want to give us a one-liner about what you study? Um, yes, so I'm basically investigating immunotherapy for cancer. Wow. So hot topic now, mm -hmm. just won the Nobel Prize. It's very exciting. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got to meet Sophie uh, which is very exciting. Oh, very cool. Yeah, lots of opportunities, it's great. Yeah, you, came, you actually hit my building, so it was, it was good. Awesome. As you do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's Oxford. <awesome. laughs> <laughs> but that's why. Yeah. What about y'all? Like, why did you choose Oxford? Well, I was here for my undergraduate, so I have okay. a slightly more skewed answer. So I decided to come back because I study something very niche that's quite difficult to study in other places. So I'm doing medieval Spanish literature, and this just felt like the best place. Uh, mm -hmm. I already knew my supervisor, and I enjoyed studying what I'm studying as an undergrad. So, yeah. so in the end, I chose Oxford because it was closer to home. I should say because it's better than Cambridge, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that wasn't the reason. But actually, I think my question might... My answer might take us off on a tangent. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. I think the real question probably <laughs> is why I nearly didn't choose Oxford. Um, and in, to be really, really truthful, so if I give you my story, um, I come from a family where like, nobody went to university or school, where nobody ever tried to go to Oxford, Cambridge, and pretty much thought, I don't know if any of you guys had this, that Oxford wasn't a place for me and that I wouldn't fit in. Uh, so there were literally two days between me thinking, no way, like Oxford's for Martians. And me being like, you know what, I'm going to give it a shot. Can't expect Oxford to give me a chance if I didn't give Oxford a sh chance. Um, I just knew nothing about the whole process and was so overwhelmed. I didn't know, did any of you guys have this idea of you have to be a particular kind of person to go to Oxford? When I got my acceptance to Oxford, I, the first person I showed in the letter was my mom. And the first said, <laughs> thing that she said was, are you sure? <laughs> right. Yeah, because imposters in. Yeah, it's like you know, <laughs> people like us, like you know, ordinary people. Especially. I grew up in the Philippines, did, did everything, all of my people studies in the Philippines, and it was just something that we never thought of that was right. really possible. And I mean, if I talk to some of my friends, no one mm -hmm. even knows what Oxford is. <laughs> so it's, uh, I took a chance. So I emailed a professor which had uh, the same research interests I did, and luckily enough, he replied like the next day and was keen to support me in my application and. Uh, here I am now, mm. two years into my PhD in Oxford. So. Amazing. So that, that is such a, that has always stood out for me, that at Oxford, I suppose you're going to apply to Oxford if you want to, if you love your course and you know that it's a cutting edge place to be, right? And I remember like leaving tutorials being taught by like world leading experts who are really, really nice. So you kind of forget how big a deal they are and going to the library and seeing like a whole row of books <laughs> written by Dr. Helen They're Barr. real people. Yes. Yeah. They're incredible. That kind of teaching is just not something you know? Yeah, I'll go in with a mint one. Okay, what most surprised you about the interview process? I think this will be interesting to see the differences between undergrad and grad level, right? I guess I can give a bit of a comparative view and I found actually the postgrad, at least for Spanish or maybe humanities interview was a lot less intense than the undergrad interview. I think there's a lot of yeah. mystique around the undergrad interview. Obviously, you're younger, and the questions for undergrad tend to be a little bit broader. But for postgrad, it was just honestly quite specific about my research proposal, about my interests, and I didn't feel too out of my depth, I think. Yeah. It's more like a friendly conversation. Yeah. yeah. Sounds yeah. nice. <laughs> yeah. My supervisor just emailed me and said, Do you want to come down for a chat? It wasn't even you know, framed as an interview. So I literally did just come down for a chat, walked into a room and there were like three people there. I was like, oh! <laughs> um, but it was really informal and uh, genuinely just like talking through, we talked through my proposal, um, but it was quite broad actually. Mm -hmm. It was a completely different experience than I've had at other levels of, you know, studying and interviews, so. 
quite chill. I think, I think the two of us we were had quite some. different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we're both kind of medical sciences. And yeah. So for us, obviously, we had all the application process. I actually spoke to my supervisor beforehand before I came. And I think you had a few Skype interviews. Yeah, I Skype. Um, I Skyped my supervisors twice before getting here. Yeah. Um, I just had a really informal chat on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then when we showed up for our interviews, the interview days, uh, I don't know what it was like for you, but I had eight people on my, my panel. They had about eight people. Yeah. So intense. Oh, I'm stressing just <laughs> thinking about it, and I've already <laughs> done PTSD. it. PTSD. <laughs> yeah. um, so we had uh, you know, experts from all these different um, fields within medical sciences. Mm -hmm. So we were asked to prepare a five or so minute presentation oh, beforehand right. just to introduce what we've done previously. Um, and lots of questions about you know, further research, you know, the research you want to pursue with supervisors here. But mostly it was just gauging your interest in science, yeah. um, which I thought was quite nice. Yeah, quite a similar concept. Yeah. So I was actually the full day. It was a long day. <sighs> well, yeah, just, just you, a full day? Well, there was a group of us, but we were all there for the full day. So it was kind of taking it in turns. So the first thing we had gave them, um, we went through, the PIs kind of gave them um, presentations of their posters, you know, their work, you know, right. you had a little chat to them, you know, get some interest, especially, you know, who you were interested in. Uh, then we had a 10-minute presentation, so a bit mm -hmm. similar, like you, just what we've already done, our interest. And then we had this um, individual interview, so that's kind of why it's called day. Um, yeah, and that was quite tough. But it was also asking general things about the field. Um, as long as you've got kind of an interest, you know what you're interested in, mm. you know, you've read around, mm. then it's alright. They also set up like this kind of pretend um, experiment. They kind of oh. said, oh, protein A, B, C, what would you do next in this experiment? I'm so they happy missed out. That. So it was like getting you yeah. thinking as well. It was like a bit of a test. Ooh, wow. but yeah, I think a lot of it is stress testing though. So as mm -hmm. long as you're kind of, you know, you know what you've done. I think a really important point um, is that you're never going to know more than the people in the room that are asking you these questions. Yeah. And a lot of the time, like you said, it's stress testing. Mm -hmm. You have to be okay with saying, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And, yes. um, and I, yeah, I think that's part of it. It's so much about just being yourself and being yeah. honest. Mm -hmm. And if I compare that to other interview experiences I've had, especially when you're an undergrad and you sort of almost get prepped by your school. My school certainly prepped us for like certain situations. Whereas this, I was just like, I'm just going to be my, all you can do is be you and do your best mm -hmm. you know and I think they respond yeah. to that honesty and especially at the grad level maybe it's a different beast than the undergrad level no though. I think yeah. it's the same thing right the same I remember having imposter syndrome because mm -hmm. everybody's buying college hoodies I was like they've made a mistake I'm just gonna leave it <laughs> <laughs> and two weeks in I was like enough's enough I'm breaking whatever pact I made with my friends I'm buying that college hoodie <laughs> but I was still insecure so I remember speaking to my tutor about this and I was like, like why, why did you pick me? Mm. Like, you know, I didn't get these grades. I wasn't this kind of person, et cetera, et cetera. She told me to shut up. <laughs> Said something which changed my narrative, which was, you know, we're not looking for polished candidates. It's yeah. impossible knowing everything about everything. It would be no fun teaching somebody. And if you knew everything, everything you wouldn't have to go to university. Absolutely. So what would be the right? point? <laughs> it's not about how much you know. It's about what you can do with what you know, your willingness to learn, your potential. Absolutely. Like, I, I think that's something undergrad and postgrad definitely yeah. do yeah. share. And it is a conversation, right? And that's something you have in common with the people who will be interviewing you. Yeah. Hopefully your enthusiasm for that subject. Yeah, yeah I think it's a lot of the time you feel like, well, at least for me, you feel, I, felt, I felt like you know, these people are out to get me. Like, you know, yeah. they're here to catch what, I'm not, what I can't answer. <laughs> so especially like, for me, like, uh, English is my second language. And yeah. like, I had like a Skype, inter Skype discussion with my supervisor first, mm -hmm. with my potential supervisor. And he like, told me, OK, this is pre be prepared to talk about your research, what your interests are. Oh, that's good. And mm -hmm. in my panel interview, so we also did, did that by Skype. There were like three people there. And yeah, it was just like a nice discussion about my research, what I did before, mm -hmm. like my master's, my master's thesis on about the uh, tectonics of the Philippines, for example. It's something that no one actually in the department knows about. about. So it's something you actually feel like you actually know something that right. these professors don't know anything about. And they're also here to learn mm -hmm. from you. Yeah. There's like yeah. an exchange yeah. of uh, knowledge, essentially. Yeah. 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 And I think that's a big thing about people have this idea about Oxford, that it's very like, hierarchical and mm -hmm you know, there's the them and then the us with, between the staff and the students, but I haven't felt that at all. No. I, if anything, you know, my supervisor certainly encourages me to think that, you know, we're, we're in it together, we're on the same level, we're learning from each other, this is very much reciprocal. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's always asking for my advice and things, you know, yeah. really I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> Can I ask what you wore to your Skype interview? Like, it's just... Just yeah, the top part. Right? <laughs> yeah, just the top part. So I was actually we were pretty worried. Did you have your pajamas on the bottom? I was worried would I be able to understand their accents because I, <laughs> I can't understand British accents very well. 
what should I wear? Thankfully, that's that, that's that. <laughs> thankfully, I was during that day of my interview. I was in a hotel. I was like, giving like a seminar to teachers. So, oh, so it's a good background. Like, oh, very yeah. professional. Yeah, nice. yeah, I was dressed properly. So I was like, okay, I might as well dress like this for yeah. my interview. And yeah, it was fine. My supervisor, like my interview kind of was super chill. They were in like their jeans and their t-shirts and I was in like a suit. I was like, I have not got this at the right level or whatever, so. <laughs> Yeah. Really Definitely different. better to overdress than underdress. Always. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Always see, overdress. I think it's just about wearing whatever you feel comfortable yeah. in, right? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. genuinely, true story, but I haven't witnessed it. <laughs> Apparently, somebody wore, uh, the senior tutor told me that somebody wore, I don't know if I should be telling you this. Uh, <laughs> Tell us. It's anonymous. It's anonymous. Wore, okay, anonymous. <laughs> a person in a college, and a, suit, a senior tutor in said college, told somebody, maybe me, uh, <laughs> that one of the prospective applicants wore a red Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer jumper during their interviews with a 3D nose which lit up. And he got a place, and I'm sure was everybody's fashion guru, yeah. right? Yeah. They're interested in how you think. Yeah. So showing yourself, how right? You think yeah. Your potential. Yeah. As a student here. So. I think if you and I'm a big believer in the power of a good outfit. Like yes. Good outfit that you feel like you win, and you can like go out. And Shouldn't say the phrase I want to say, but like, you know, what do you want to say? I want to say, like, kick ass, you know? I'll say it. Go for it. You know, I feel that as long as you're wearing something that you're like, actually, no, I can do this. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so what has being part of your college been like or mean to you? I think it's really fantastic to have a home that is away from your institute. Yeah. Um, as much as we all love our specific subjects, I think it gets a little dry when you are, you know, all day, nine to five, talking about science or English or music, and then you go to dinner and you're still talking about it. So it's really nice to be able to go home to a college and um, connect with people outside your discipline. Well, it's nice to meet people, yeah, that you wouldn't normally meet. Oh, right? definitely, Different yeah. Courses and For sure. Schools, yeah. yeah. It's like a small supportive community, right? Yeah. And what colleges are you guys at? Uh, me, I'm at St. Cross College, and I think one thing that I love about being at St. Cross is like it's like 60% international students. Oh, cool. So okay. you do meet people from all around the world. And it's nice to see people from all walks of life being in one place and, you know. Yeah. Does anybody have college animals? <laughs> what? Yes. We, we have, have, yes. we we have dog visits. Oh. For example, time, so we can just stroke. Oh. Just nice for me doing therapy. We also have, so we have alpacas for Welfare Week. Oh. LMH cat, LMH dogs on Instagram, by the way. Um, Are you plugging the Instagram? I'm just yeah. going to so <laughs> LMH dogs, please one. follow. Yeah. <laughs> just plugging. Um, but actually, I don't really like animals, so that's up to me. <laughs> uh, I've wasted on you. I, just think, I mean, I'm at St. John's. I don't think we have anything. No. I'm at Hartford, and we have a cat, but it's oh, a very sort nice. of unfriendly, reserved, as you would expect a cat maybe to be. Uh, and we had welfare dogs in the other week, and it was very territorial. Oh, it literally yeah. stood in the entrance of the college and wouldn't let the dogs pass by. So. Did any of you guys know what colleges were before you? Because I had no idea. It was so overwhelming. No idea. I think that it's just like when you look at the Wikipedia, there are 30 <laughs> names and it's like, am I supposed to study all these before I put preferences right. down? I think my supervisor was really great at the time when I was applying at sort of pushing his own college for now, for now. Um, but and pointing out all the different advantages and sort of perks you get from certain colleges. So maybe that's another. Yeah, that's true because like in the college you can like apply for bursaries, for like if you want to travel to a conference or mm. do it for your, for your research and there you are know, different ways that colleges uh, offer this to the students, right? Yeah. I guess in the, fir the first year. Yeah, not, not, yet. not yet. I haven't, but lots of my friends, you know, got help with going to conferences and things. Mm -hmm. um, just if you needed a bit more support, if you've got a new, new idea for a project, you want to make it a bit more interdisciplinary, but mm -hmm. very college specific. So yeah, I'm at Balliol. Yeah. <laughs> but I think regardless of like, you know, uh, how much of a college has, if you have a good reason for traveling, like I yeah. went to a conference uh, last year in Washington DC, and the college was pretty generous in giving me some support for my uh, travel there so I could talk about my research because I mean they are pretty supportive for their students endeavors and mm -hmm. so I think if you do try to seek out these opportunities and just like talk to the uh, the heads of the college I'm sure they'll be willing to have definitely more support for you. Yeah. Okay. All right. okay. Uh, what inspired you to choose your course? I guess my master's. So I was already kind of doing you know, this project mainly therapy, yeah. my kind of specialist field, and again just looking around who else is doing it, and they yeah. they already had the facilities as people doing it. It was great. So yeah, just my masters, I guess. I just remember really loving English and like 
dissecting words and reading and using that as a form of escapism and knowing that I would really enjoy it for that period of time. And I think that's so, so important. Like whatever it is that you're doing, doing something you love is, is going to make that time easier, right? Yeah. I'm definitely on the you know, personal note. Like a lot of family members who have been um, you know, touched by disease, and I think that that type of personal motivation can be ver very um, uh, important for igniting a passion, yeah. right? And so, like, it gets me up in the morning knowing that I can help with innovation, pushing the field, and hopefully these advances that you make in the lab can eventually go back to you know patients in the clinic and right. even your own family members. So that's probably why I chose this field and wanting to come and work with the people that wrote the book, right? Yeah, it's similar to me because I've been cancer. Everyone knows somebody's had cancer, right? So it's just nice. It's really rewarding because, you know, I do sometimes have the chance to see the patients, you know, see it the whole way through, you know, you see the benefit. So it's really rewarding. Yeah. I think that's the, the great thing about grad study when you're given the sort of bigger scope to do something in, mm. rather than following courses like an undergraduate. Um, mm. And then you can do something that perhaps does give back to a community or has like an outreach mm. element to it, um, which is really important. It was certainly a really important thing for, for me. Yeah, absolutely. I guess I was inspired by going into quite a niche field and just seeing how much literature there was that people just didn't know about. And I just mm -hmm. want to bring that like to the present yeah. day and show the relevance of, I guess, the medieval period for the present day, what we can learn from uh, religions and race relations from the Middle Ages today. So I think it's, yeah, it's a personal motivation, but it's a very sort of long time period to cover as well. Yeah. So. I think the good thing yeah. about Oxford where, I mean, Yes, you, 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 do some, you can do something socially rather than, but it's also a space where you can explore big questions. Yes. Where, you know, just answering basic science questions or basic questions about humanity or philosophy, mm -hmm. things like that. So I think it's important for us to drive our knowledge forward. It eventually also drives an innovation in different fields. Mm -hmm. Because without uh, driving our knowledge from the basics, uh, we won't be able to explore avenues, you know, where we can actually do things in the, on the ground, do things that will uh, help people's lives and things like that. I feel like you need to drop the mic. Like. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yes. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> Next one. Cool. What was the most difficult part of writing your application? Ooh, I guess the research proposal for me. I don't know if anyone else feels the same, but it's very difficult. Like if you're applying for a PhD or a DPhil and you're in your master's sort of final year, or you're about to hand in like your dissertation of your master's, you're still then you have to think of this kind of long uh, three-year project, and it's just very difficult to project that far into the future when you still haven't finished the degree that you're doing. But I think it goes back to the point we made about interviews, where it's not they don't expect you to be the expert. You just have to have good ideas and just and just coherently be and coherent and well. and, and yeah. just willing to challenge things and do something new. I, mean, I think for me, I, I had some time out between my masters and starting my DPhil. So in a way, like writing the proposal, I felt a bit out of it that I wasn't in like the academic mindset or the right environment. Um, so I, I reached out to like my former master's supervisor and and friends that were still doing stuff. So we just give it a read, see if I'm like on the right track, am I like completely on a different planet or whatever. So having people that can that can like proofread and help you out is really important, especially if you're taking some um, you know, time away from study. Yeah. Did you find it helpful in hindsight to have had that time out of study? Before yeah, it was an absolute blessing. I think it gave me a bit. I actually didn't know where I wanted to do my PhD. Um, I needed because I'm working in uh, refugee camps. I need a lot of time to figure out logistics and stuff like that, ethical stuff. Um, so I just wanted a bit of headspace from it, and I'd done quite. a intense undergrad and masters so I just took some time away I did something that was seemingly not related to it at all and that was the best thing I could have done I got some life experience and so, so were you working or was it just taking a break you know yes yeah, so I worked uh, I was working in a theatre backstage oh, in an opera okay. theatre yeah it's not that glamorous um, <laughs> no, um, no it was really great and uh, it was still in the art so I sort of kept a foot in that, that door so to speak but it was it was the absolute best thing I thought I came back like refreshed to do it and I knew then that I wanted to do it it wasn't sure. something that I was doing oh I finished my master's might as well do a PhD I knew it was I was like actually I've had the time away and realized I really don't want to have like a job like this um, <laughs> so, I would yeah. definitely echo because I, I had a similar thing I took I did my undergrad then I had three years where I was working and right. I had a part-time master's while I was working wow and I think it just really helped me realize as you said that it's something I really want to do yeah and what so. I don't want to do which is work <laughs> in business <Yeah. laughs> but it was very useful to know how the other half live and like what that's yeah. like um, and, and you get I think it gives you uh, maybe a little bit of perspective when you're yeah. coming to DFL. I've certainly 
when I was doing my undergrad and masters, it was like all about the study and like almost having like no life outside of that that desk that you sit at. But I think having a job and doing other stuff was like actually there's a balance to be struck even when you are studying that you can still. Yeah, have a have a life. <laughs> exactly. And I think a lot of people might like wonder whether a part time masters is looked against as the same as a full time masters. Mm. I think that's a question that gets thrown up and in my experience it hasn't really affected things. Um, and I think yeah. it can be a good experience because yeah. you get to do a job and and study at the same yeah. time. So yeah. It's important for like saving as well. Funding yeah, exactly. So that's also really helpful. The grad funding. So. Sorry, I've derailed this. <laughs> no, it's, <all> right. <laughs> it's the practical stuff as well. It's really important. I mean, for us, it's good to get as many you know research experiences as you yeah. can. So I try to do placements. You know, this is what I did between my undergrad, and my masters. You know, a little break. Right. Yeah, they yeah. really like that. Just as much experience as you can. Mm -hmm. To be honest. I think uh, the most difficult part of the application for me was convincing myself that I wanted to study this niche topic for f four plus years. Right, and you know, I think that. You know, you have to ask yourself a lot of deep questions. I think it's a lot easier to, you know, stay very flexible and choose a career that allows you to like move in so many different types of options. And not that the PhD doesn't, but you know, realistically, you are studying this one topic and only this topic for four years. You've got to really like it. You got to really like it. Exactly. <laughs> I also took some time off um, after my undergrad to, you know, get away from classes and the the rat race of getting you know the best grades you can. And I was still convinced at the end that this is what I wanted to do, but um, that was a tough part for me, is just telling myself, you know, you actually really do want to spend four years studying this one thing and uh, hopefully push the bounds of what we know a little bit, yeah. so. Yeah. I think that idea of the Oxford type is so interesting, and if, if there were one piece of advice I could give to anyone based on my own experience, it would be please, please don't buy into the misconceptions. You know, I pretty much thought that you had to be a particular kind of person from a particular background, from a particular school, and nearly shot myself in the foot by not applying. And actually, you know, we're not looking for a type of person. There is no type, except that people have in common their love of a subject. But it did take me taking a chance and applying in the first place to find that out. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it's a bit, bit cheesy, but you do have to kind of believe in yourself. You know, you've got the grades, yeah. you are good enough, and you can get in regardless of background, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, you can do it, Absolutely. you're good enough. I think you're